Thank you, Lord, for another great day that you give us. Another beautiful day with the sun shining. and Another Sabbath day that we can come to your house and sing praises to you and and just hear a new and refreshing word. And Father, I just pray that this day that your Spirit will move in this place in a mighty way, teaching us what we need to learn and what we need to see about the, about the church that we're going to be speaking about today in your book of Revelation. And let us learn from these past history things and the writings that John wrote that you showed him. And teach us what we need to see and what we should see and what each and every one of us on an individual basis need to learn to get closer to you and just to seek your face. And even God as a church, what we all need to learn as a church together of what your true true church is supposed to be like and what we're supposed to do according to what your word tells us. And again, I just pray that you just hide me behind that precious cross that the words I speak of you and you alone, God. Only of you and not of man. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. <coughs> Alright, we're going to start with the churches starting today and we'll be in Revelation chapter 2. And this, actually it begins in verse 1. But at the same time, while, I'm, while I got it on my mind, Kind of put a finger in Psalms 139 because I want to hit on it. And I'm going to kind of move just a little bit fast, okay, because I want you to, to kind of paint a picture in your mind of what this place is like and where, where kind of the setting of it is. You know, it's in Asia. And, uh, you know, John was on Patmos. We talked about this last week. He was on Patmos. There were seven churches right on that coast by the uh, Agarian Sea which is above the Mediterranean Sea, and he wrote to these churches. He was writing these, this letter to these churches, to all seven churches. So you can kind of get a picture of what, what was kind of happening here. So he wrote these letters to these churches, and we'll just read this and we'll run through it. In Revelation 2, starting in verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Now remember the angel... Uh, kind of determined a little bit that it was the pastor or the, or the leader of the church that he was writing this letter to. It says, these things, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Now, let me stop there just a minute. Remember the word evil does not necessarily mean a murderer or rapist or anything like that. It, it does mean those things, but it also means other things like jealousy, gossiping, envying, just all those different things. So anything that is against God's word is evil. It, it doesn't necessarily have to mean a drastic thing. All right, going on. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of Nicola Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So see, just in that one little writing to this particular church, he, he just he kind of builds them up and then throws a something hard at them, okay? So you remember last week we talked about the angels of the church, the seven stars and seven golden lampstands, which, you know, the angels is basically a messenger, one that was sent to teach. That's what it means. And also an angel means a messenger, one who was sent, a message from God, a pastor to lead, guide, and direct. So that's that kind of just touches back on 
the very first verse. Now remember over in Revelation 1 and 20 it says this, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So see, it kind of <clears throat> kind of clears it up just a little bit from what he was talking about in chapter in verse 1. Now, let me give you just a little bit of history of, of this place, Ephesus. On, in, Paul's, <clears throat> excuse me, in Paul's second missionary journey, in Acts 18, starting in verse 18, let me just read this real quick. It says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Now see, these two people were also in Ephesus teaching. Okay, they were teaching God's word. And it says, he had his hair cut off in Centuria, for he had taken a vow, which is something else. And he said he came to Ephesus and left them there. So see, he left these two people there. And let me stop. Some people believe that he also left Timothy there. Okay? So just something to think about. So he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews when they asked him to stay a little, stay longer time with them. He did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So see, Paul was there in Ephesus. Remember, he was on one of his missionary journeys, and he started, he began this church, and also in Acts 19 and 10, it says this, and this was when Paul was in Ephesus. It says, and this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So see, Paul even stayed there for two years, teaching and preaching. So you know, you know, you know who Paul was, and he was on his journey, and he was there. Now, according to history, okay, according to history, Ephesus was a big city. It was a big place. It was estimated to have something like 250,000 people living in this city. So it was a big city, you know, for being over in Asia. Now, also in this city, <clears throat> they had a lot, of, a lot of structures. They had synagogues, temples, and this type of stuff, but also had a theater. There was a theater there, and this thing was constructed so big that it was said that this thing would hold like 25,000 people in it. In this one theater, now you got to remember, this was what in ninety six, eighty, you know. So it was it was huge. It was a big place. Now, also in this same city, they had a god that they worshipped. Okay, they had a god there that they worshipped in in Ephesus. Now, remember one verse, <clears throat> one verse, and I read this a while back. And whenever Paul was there, remember they, they had this they had this God that they worshipped, and the blacksmiths and people there would make little little dolls, okay, of this particular God and would sell them. So they was making money off of this. And Acts nineteen and twenty four says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no Small profit to the craftsman. So see, Paul was preaching the gospel, so people were turning into Christians. They were turning their life over to the Lord and beginning to follow them, and they quit buying the little shrines. Okay, so that was happening. But also, <clears throat> even, even in this place, the, the, it, it was a Greek goddess, and her original name was called Artemis. That, that was her name. The Romans turned and began calling her Diana, okay? But she was a goddess of fertility. The Romans called her Diana. Now there's a there was a temple built for this particular goddess. Okay, it was that there was this massive, huge temple, and even to this day, to this day, it is considered one of the seven wonders of the world. This temple that was built for this goddess. This thing was 425 foot long. That's what this temple was. It was 220 feet wide, and it was 60 feet tall. They, they built this thing for this goddess. It also had great folding doors. It had 127 marble pillars, and many of those pillars were covered in pure gold for this particular goddess. That ain't real. okay? But anyway, that's what they did. So Paul was there. So you can imagine this church in Ephesus, the job that they had, okay? 
you can just picture of what they were up against, the things that they were having to do and, and try to teach people about the Lord. So that gives you a little bit of a picture of what Ephesus kind of looked like and what was happening at the time. Now in verse 2 it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. <clears throat> now this particular thing where it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. This, this little phrase where it says, I know your works. I know I'm moving a little bit fast, but I've got to do this to get to a point. It says, I know your works. Now, this is where Psalms 139 comes in. And in each one, of, if you go and read each, about each church, each seven churches, you will find that phrase. And each one of them, I know your works. I know your works. I know your works. Each one has that phrase. Now, I know your works. So that kind of makes you think a little bit. If God knows the works of a church, what does he know about you? I know your works. Paul said this in, in Psalms 139, starting in verse 1, if you want to look at it. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So see, if God knows a church, a church, a church is a group of people, like I said last week, it's not this building. Y'all know this. <clears throat> it's a group of people. We personally make up a church. So he knows us. Okay? So he even knows us corporately. He knows us individually. He knows every move you make. He knows every thought you think. He knows everything your eyes see, everything your ears hear, every motive within your heart. He knows it. He knows it. Every bit of it. Isn't that kind of a scary thing? Kind of makes you think. You know, whenever you sit down and you're blaring and looking at a TV and you're looking at something maybe you know you don't say you're supposed to be looking at. And he knows it. He knows what you're doing. He knows every thought, everything you do, every even, even every desire. Can you picture it? Some somebody knows what you're doing. You know, you, you hear many people say, "Well, you can't even walk down the street because the Secret Service and the government knows everything you're doing." Well, probably do, but he does. He knows. There, there's no getting away around it. There's no hiding from it. There, there's nothing. Even if you look down in verse seven, same one, verse seven. Now, this is out of the King James. It says, "Where shall I go from Thy Spirit? Where can I go?" says, or where shall I free, flee from your presence? So you can't go anywhere. You can't run anywhere. It says, if I ascend into heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. That's what it says. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, Shall your hand lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. No matter where you go, no matter where you run, no matter where you hide, he's there. He, he's there. You, you, can't, you cannot run from God. You know, and, and, it's, and it's, really, it's, 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 kind of, <laughs> it's really a scary thought. It really is. I remember one time whenever I was going through treatment, and I mean, it was it was just, and I've shared this with you with you guys, how, how painful it was, and, and the hurting, and the crying, and and just all the different things. And and I had got a niece in Oklahoma. She's going through a, a lymphoma type stuff, and she's going through kind of some chemo and different things. And we text back and forth, sharing battle scars and battle wounds and this type of stuff. And I told her one day, I said, you know, I, I, I get so upset and mad that I just want to run and just run away. And she reminded me of this verse. She said, no, worry, no matter where you go, God is there. No matter what you do, He's still there. No matter how you hurt, 
He's still there. No matter how loud you scream, how hard you cry, how, how, how much you beg or anything else, he's still there. You can't, you can't get away from him. So see, even, even in, in the writing that he wrote to this church, he says, I know your works. I know you. I know what you're doing. And then it goes on. It says, and, and you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. So see, these people, these people in this church, they, they, they were doing such great things and, and they were learning the Word of God and they were beginning to learn how to discern people. Remember we talked about one time how, how uh, deceivers sneak in. You know, and like I shared with you, they don't come through the windows, friends. They come through the doors. And then they deceive. They learned how to see these people. They did. They, they learned how to spot them. They learned how to listen and how people carry themselves, the way they talk, the way they uh, possibly share the gospel. Were they doing it right? Were they doing it wrong? They, they begin to learn how, how to... How to discern these things in first john 4 and 1 it says behold i do not believe do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of god because many false prophets have gone out into the world well see they 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 knew this they began learning and knowing how to do this so they were just really doing things upright in the way that god said and if you look down in verse 4 it says you are of god little children, and have overcome them. So see, and, and what this is kind of saying, basically, is, is, is they knew God. They wanted to follow Him. They wanted to do what His Word says. They wanted to be upright and everything. So they were doing everything possible to do everything by the letter. So they, you know, they, were, they knew how to overcome them because He who is in you is greater than, than he who is in the world. So we know this. If God lives within us, then the one that lives within us is greater than the one that's in the world trying to get the world to follow the world. Okay? And it goes on and says, They are of the world. Therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. It says we are of God. We, who He who knows God hears us. So see, the people who know the Lord want to hear more about the Lord. The truth about God, the truth about who He is. It says, He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So see, the more we learn about God, the more we learn about what His Word says, how we're supposed to carry ourselves, the act, talk, and all this type of stuff, then the more we listen to the Spirit. And the more we listen to the Spirit, the more we learn discernment. And the way that we learn discernment is by doing all of these things. And that way, whenever people try to come into the church and try to deceive and lead people astray, we know that they're wrong. And that's when we stop it. And that goes into something else. That's where a lot of churches fail, friends, because they don't stop it. They don't stop people from going into Sunday school classes and teaching things that don't even exist in the Bible. And they teach things wrong, telling them it's okay to watch these weird shows on TV, filling their children with things of evil, killing, murder. What about all these stupid games? We hand them electronics and let them play games that, that are just totally wrong. But they'd say it's okay. When we know by the word of God, it says no. It says leave these things alone. Don't mess with them. You carry yourself. You do the way that God says. Another thing in Acts 20. It says, in 29, it says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So in other words, he's telling them that they're coming in to destroy they want to break up churches. They want to break up people. It says, also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things. So see, even people come in, they get people that are in the church to basically begin changing their minds and they begin walking away from the Lord. This is, this is kind of some stuff that was kind of happening in the church. Speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that 
For three years I did not cease to warn you, warn everyone night and day with tears. So see, Paul was warning people. Warning them. They were coming. They're in there. But these people learned how to pick them out. They learned how to pick them out. Now just bear with me. I'm trying to paint a picture in your mind. I want you to think about the, this church, of, of the, the great things that they were doing. They were doing some great and powerful things. They, they, they really were. And it goes on. says <clears throat> in Revelation, says, And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And you know what the word persevere means, and I, and I love this. And this is where a lot of people, and especially in a church, this is where a lot of people, and I think even, and, I, and I'll say it, I think sometimes even pastors fail many times in this particular area. The word persevere, continue in a course of action even in the face of difficulty. No matter how hard it gets, you keep following the Lord. No matter how hard it gets. Does it get hard? Yeah. Can anybody vouch for, with me? Nobody? It does get hard. But you keep fighting and you keep pushing. That is perseverance. No matter how hard it gets, you keep pushing. And that's what he's saying. You have persevered and have patience. What patience? Waiting on the Lord. Knowing that He's going to come through. He's going to do what He says He'll do. And He will keep His promises. That's hanging on to the promises. And He says, you have labored for my name's sake. Going out in the world, doing things. We're doing this for God. We're doing this for Jesus. We're doing this for, for Jesus. We're, do, we're, you know, we're here for Jesus. Doing things for the Lord. And they persevered and they keep on. So I want you to picture they're in a city that 90 probably did. The majority of the city worships this Diana. People in this city are trying to come into the churches. They're converting people into Christianity. But yet they're still hanging on to some of the other rituals and things that they used to do. And they're possibly trying to bring this stuff into the church. And they have learned to discern it and see these things and they're stopping it. Because they dislike it. They don't like it and they don't want it and they don't want it up in their church. And that's powerful. It really is. If you stop and think about it because they're not allowing garbage to come into the church. And they're laboring for my name's sake and have not become weary. You see, they're hanging on. No matter how tough it gets, they're hanging on. Hanging on to the promises. And it goes on. If you look in verse 6, it says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So see, so he wrote this, he hates the deeds of this particular person. Okay? Not a whole lot is mentioned about this guy. It, it, which it was a person that turned into like a, a cult. Okay? And you see this all over the world today. You know, one man gets something started, they name it after him or lady or whoever it was. Anyway, this particular person kind of kicked in something. And he was starting this, uh, this, this, this movement, okay, if you want to call it that. This movement uh, of doing things, and he was trying to bring this stuff into the church or possibly start a church of, of the things that he did. And it, it says, but this you have that you hate the deeds of Nicolaitans. And look at what it says, which I also hate. So see, Jesus is even saying, I even hate it. You hate it. But not only you, but me. I hate what they're doing. This guy, <clears throat> the name Nicolation, let me just read this. It says it's derived from a Greek word, Nicolaos. It says a compound of words, Nikos and Laos. Two different words. The word Nikos is the Greek word that means conquer or subdue. Okay? That one little word, Nikos, means conquer or subdue. subdue. The word Laos is the Greek word for People. Conquer people. Subdue people. That's what his name means. Conquer people or subdue people. Compound into ones, they form the name Nicholas, which literally means one who conquers or subdues the people. 
So see, this is what this guy was doing, going into the different places, possibly trying to get into this church or even start his own church, trying to get people to follow the things that he was trying to do. And the things this guy was doing in this particular time in history was not cool. He was, he was one bad dude. He was. Let me just read some stuff. This is, these, are, these are some items that is believed what this person does or did at this particular time. It says they engaged in ritual prostitution. This was part of their beliefs. This was part of their church. They even done such things as, as like a trance inducing techniques to remove inhabitations and social constraints of believers. Trying to put them in some form of a trance. You may say, well, how do you do that? Well, let me share this with you. If you go to some of these different churches, I'm just going to say different churches, okay? You go to some of these different churches and the music that they play, the music that they play, it sounds so good and it's so moving. And they just keep playing it over and over and over and sooner or later you'll begin acting like they do because you believe it's doing something. That is the type of trance that they would do in this particular time and even today. They do the same thing today. And it goes on. <clears throat> it says uh, that, that, that these people would get into this type of trance and they would go into some form of animalistic state of mind. They would eat things sacrificed to idols and even commit sexual immorality. And they even supported polygamy and or holding of wives in common. That's the way they believed. And they were trying to bring this stuff into the church. And you may say, well, I don't know of any churches that do it today. Begin studying churches today. Begin studying and looking at the different religions today. The things that people practice, the things that people believe, the things that you can, you can see. And just like last week, I think I shared that even today, even today, they are, have such things called Christian witches. If you don't believe me, go study it. Look it up. And they're allowing it in the churches. Remember the sermon I did on Halloween? God said you don't like it. He said leave it alone. But they're allowing it in churches today. See, kind of the same thing. They're, they're trying to bring things in. And this is what it says. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus said it. He said, I hate it. I hate what this person is doing. So see, that's another example of, of what was happening around this church. But the word hate comes from a Greek word which means messio, which means hate to arbor or to find utterly repulsive. Because you, you can even imagine Jesus saying this. In Proverbs 6, and you've heard me read this before, it says the sixth thing that God hates, yes, seven are an abomination, a proud look, a lying tongue, shed of innocent blood, devised wicked plans, feet that swift to run to evil, the false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. And this thing this guy was doing, if you look at all of it, basically he was doing it. He was lying. He was probably proud of what he did. The shed of innocent blood. In some places, guys, they do human sacrifices. And it's sad to say, they did it then. They did it then. Devised wicked plans. Remember, I, I gave you an explanation at one time of the word wicked. It doesn't necessarily mean a witch or warlock or anything like that. What is wicked? Anything that is against God. Anything. You name it, you can pick it. If it's against God, it's wicked in his eyes. And he hates it. He hates all of that. Swift to running to evil. And that's what he was doing, this guy was. Speaking lies. He was telling people lies of everything. You know, he's probably taking the word of God and twisting it and turning it into a lie. Which makes it sound good. And that's what people do today. And probably what this guy was doing. Sowing discord among the brethren. That's kind of self-explanatory. In Revelations 2 and 14, you'll find this person again. It says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block 
before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who holding the doctrine of Nicolaeans, which thing I hate. Another verse for another church. You see, same thing was happening in another place. So it wasn't just at Ephesus, it was somewhere else. So that paints you a little bit of a picture. This is where it kind of kicks in a little bit. Keep in mind the thing I read before, where it says, I know your works. Okay? I know your works. Y'all keep that in mind. So we're going to kind of back up to verse 4 again. It says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. He's talking to the church. See, they're doing all these great things. They're laboring. They're patient. Persevering. But then he turned and he said, I have this against you. That you left your first love. It says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from your place, unless you repent. So what happened? They were doing all these great things for God. They were doing what, you know, probably what the Bible says, helping others, the widows, the orphans, doing all these great things. But he says, I have this against you. You've left your first love. But they were doing all of these great things. Guys, a church can get so busy doing things that they forget Him. That they totally forget the Lord. But they're doing it for the Lord. You say, what do you mean? Look at it this way. In Acts 3 and 19 it says, Repent then and turn to the Lord, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. These people in this church they had great works. They were, they were doing things, probably going out cutting grass and painting people's houses, putting new shingles on, all of these great things. But they lost their passion for Jesus. They lost their hunger. They lost their desire. You say, what do you mean? How often do you talk to God? How often do you truly talk to Him? Get on your knees, maybe beside your bed, your couch. Or maybe just riding down the road. Do you talk to Him? Do you commune with Him? Do you tell Him your true heart? Do you let Him know that you know who you are? Do you have a true relationship with Him? Can you say that God talks to you? Can you say that I know when the Holy Spirit prompts me and tells me that I'm doing wrong? Can you say that if, if, if I'm looking at something on TV and, and, and you, you feel with inside of yourself something saying, cut it off, cut it off, stop looking at it, do you do it? Do you have that relationship? Do you love the Lord so much? Do you love God so much? That when you think about the cross, you just about shed a tear or either you do shed a tear. Do you think about the things that Jesus done to the point that it hurts when you think about the things that you do? This past week, I had the opportunity to go to the coast and spend time with my daughter and her husband, little Bubba, and we went fishing. And the whole time I was down there, I was thinking about this message. And I kept thinking over and over and over again, I have this against you. I have this against you. You have left your first love. Do you remember, do you, re do you distinctly remember and I'm asking everybody. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but I want you to think about it. Do you remember the day and the hour? And I'm talking about not numbers, 
that the day you truly turn your life over to Jesus. Can you say, I remember it like it was yesterday. Do you, do you remember? I was told one time, I was really going through a hard time in my life. And I, I was just, my mama had passed away and, you know, you know, you all know how it is, but things were just in a turmoil. And I just, I was miserable and I knew that God was working on me and I knew he was, he was wanting me to do what I'm doing now and I kept fighting and fighting, doing it my way and, and I knew it was wrong. And I, I went to a friend and he said, look, I, I, I don't know what to tell you, brother. I, I don't know what to tell you. He said, let me call somebody. So he called a pastor friend and I know the guy. And it, it, we went, went and sat down and ate and, and he, he began talking and, and, and he asked me, he said, what, what do you think God wants you to do? And I told him. I said, I know what God wants me to do, but I personally really don't want to do it. And that's the very reason, because I told you, because we're all accountable. The ones who are teachers are accountable more, more highly than the ones who don't. But anyway, he said, you know what? You need to go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. And that's all he said. He never explained it. He never explained anything, told me what he was talking about, a verse of Scripture, anything. He said, you need to go back to the beginning. And I pondered on this for months. Pondered on it and pondered on it. And then one day it rung a bell. I thought back on the day that I was saved. The joy. The peace. The the. You know, Webster don't even make words for how it feels when you got God inside. There, there's no words. I'm sure God has one, but Webster don't. Of, of, of the true serenity of knowing that you were in His arms and no one could touch you because you knew that Jesus was in you and you knew without a doubt that everything was fine. You knew that, that if, if, if God took your last breath right then where you'd go. And you wept. And for the first time in your life, you truly knew what love meant. Words can't describe how much I love my wife. They can't. But there's no words for the love that I felt the day that I gave my life to God. That's a different love. It's, it's a peace love. That man told me to go back to the beginning. We well, see, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And look what it says in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember. All the way back in the beginning, how things were so beautiful and so great and something went different. There was no love or passion, no desire to read, pray, spend time with others. Spend time with Christian friends and learning and seeking and wanting more. Like all of that has faded away to these people. This word nevertheless means despite all of that. So you can imagine whenever Jesus told him, he said despite all of that. Despite all of that, I have this against you. You know, the problem, and I, and I just kind of wrote this down to kind of, maybe just to remember. So the problem was that they lost their zeal and their desire, their hunger, their thirst, and even their love for Christ. They were just going through the motions. Don't let the world don't let people don't even let your church make you go through the motions don't lose your first love if you feel like this is happening what did it say do repent and do the first works Repent and do the first works. 
What are the first works? Pouring your heart and soul into following Him. Every bit of it. No matter what. Persevere, remember? Doing everything, no matter how hard it gets. Persevering and pushing. Desiring, hungering. Do what you know you're supposed to be doing. Matthew 24 and 11 says this, says, then, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Do you keep the laws of God in your heart? That's where they go. That's where they belong. That's where they're supposed to be. Proverbs 4 and 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence. So you have to keep it. You have to keep your heart. Let Jesus, if, he's, if we say that He lives in our heart, then our heart is supposed to be changed. That's what it is. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. From out of it springs the issues of life. If Jesus is in a person's heart, then people should see Jesus. They should see Him. Jeremiah 2 and 2. This is in the Living Bible. It says, go and shout this in Jerusalem streets. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me. It says, I remember how eager you were to please me. As a young bride long ago, how you loved me and followed me even through the barren desert. Perseverance, remember? No matter how hard it gets, you never let go. You never let go. You keep loving Him. You keep loving Him. Y'all know this one. Matthew 22 and 37 says, Jesus said to them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And I'm going to say this. I think that's where, that's where many, a lot, I'm just going to say a lot, Okay. Many churches kind of fail. They get so busy doing things. They forget to love Him. They forget to worship Him. They forget to, to pray, to study, read, and research, and, 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 and seeking fellowship with other Christians to draw that strength from others. It's like we was talking this morning. Friends, if you know Jesus Christ, if you're Lord and Savior, you're not in the battle alone. You're not. And it takes all of us together to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. It said this, I found this. It says the Ephesian church was a working church, and they were. we just seen that. Was a was a working church. Sometimes a focus on working for Jesus will, listen, sometimes the working church, Sometimes the focus on working for Jesus will eclipse the love relationship with Him. You know what an eclipse is. You know, it blocks out the sun. It goes on and says, We can put what we do for Jesus before who we are in Him. Think about it. We can put what we do for Jesus before what we are are in him and listen to this and i love this we can leave jesus in the temple just as the parents of jesus did i thought that was so sharp you know you've heard the phrase a, a jailhouse christian you know when they leave they leave jesus in a jail and they just go out back out in the world they find him in jail but when they leave they leave him in a jail People in the churches do it too. People in the churches do it. They come, they punch their card on Sunday morning when they walk out. They were no different before they walked in. No change. They just punch their card. We've done our little thing. We've done our deed for the week. This last one. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes... To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
you know, you can look at this two different ways. Well, really not two different ways because both of these are pretty much the same. And I got The more I got to thinking and reading and, and looking at this and, and, and really praying, and, and you know, this was a warning. This was a warning from the Lord. It was. But it was also a promise. A warning and a promise, all in these few verses. If you don't get it right, I'm going to shut it down. How many churches have you ever seen close up, shut the doors? You see a for sale sign in the yard. You ever wonder why? What happened? Do you ever wonder? I can't answer it, but I got a pretty good idea. If you really think about it. Let us learn from the church at Ephesus. If you don't truly know how to love Jesus, you know my answer, and that's ask Him. Teach me to fall in love with you. Teach me to fall in love with you. Love him, guys. Don't just follow, but love him. Not just because of what he did. Yes, he, he, he did something great for us. But love him for who he is. Go all the way back to the day that you say that you ask him into your life. Was there a change? Did you feel those things that I mentioned? Or it might have been something greater that I mentioned. Or it might have been nothing at all. That's why you hear me so many times harp about the fact coming up, shaking a preacher's hand, getting dunked in the water, will not get you into heaven. There has to be a change. And one, one is falling in love with him. To the point that when you do something wrong, it hurts. It hurts to the point that it could bring tears.